Good morning, uh, good afternoon, I should say, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this press conference with Director General Roberto Azevedo uh, on the uh, decision today by the General Counsel to give the Director General a second term as DG. The DG will begin with a brief statement. We will take your questions after that. I think the ladies have been handing out at the back his rather long statement yesterday when he spoke to the membership and took questions from them. That's available there. Without further ado, Director General, you have the floor, please. Oh, I turned it off instead of on. <laughs> I was saying thank you for being here and good afternoon. Uh, and also said that I would make a brief statement, which is probably a bit longer than I usually do, but I think it's uh, important that I do that. So this morning, the General Council meeting uh, uh, of the WTO members formally appointed me as Director General for a second term, um, and I'm very pleased uh, to announce that. This is a great honor uh, to me, and I pledged to continue to serve all WTO members to the best of my ability and to do all that I can to safeguard and strengthen the multilateral system uh, itself. And I gave a long presentation to members which I um, made available to you today. So let me give you a few of the highlights. Um, so I made the case that uh, the WTO is significantly stronger today than it was in 2013. At that point, the WTO had not delivered any uh, major multilaterally negotiated outcomes, uh, but since then we have achieved a run of important agreements. Uh, within 100 days of taking office as DG, we agreed the Bali package, which includes a trade facilitation agreement, and that success uh, belongs to members. Um, and I would like to think that I helped them uh, achieve uh, those uh, outcomes. Now, two years later, uh, we did it again uh, in Nairobi. We delivered a new package of, measure, uh, of measures, including our biggest uh, agricultural reforms. Um, development issues were also at the heart of both of these packages. Also in Nairobi, a group of members uh, struck a deal to expand the information technology agreement. So that was the major uh, tariff cutting agreement of the WTO since 1996. So this is a dramatic uh, shift in gears. Uh, we also worked uh, to bring the DDA to the fore, uh, though, of course, progress was, was hard to come by. Um, we worked hard and we tried every approach that we could think of, uh, but still we could not bridge the gaps between members' positions. Now those gaps remain today, and so the work must continue. Uh, these issues are critical for a large number of members, and we must keep working to take them forward. Um, and we need to maintain uh, the momentum uh, that we have built up. So we need to continue this habit of delivering, and we need to make incremental progress um, wherever and whenever uh, we can. So it is encouraging that members are implementing the commitments that they make here, and the entry into force of the TRIPS amendment uh, last month <clears throat> and the trade facilitation agreement last week uh, are clear signs of that. Um, this is a sign that we're getting the system uh, to work again, uh, and it is underlined by the speed of ratifications of the trade facilitation agreement, um, which uh, only opened for uh, ratifications um, just two years ago, uh, in November 2014. Um, as you know, nothing happens overnight uh, here, uh, but against uh, the more than 11 years uh, that it took uh, to bring the TRIPS amendment into force, uh, the TFA process has been completed uh, very efficiently. We have proved that 164 members can work together in a meaningful way to deliver and to implement uh, real outcomes. And as we look forward, uh, I think we can achieve uh, much more. Uh, we must learn from the lessons uh, that uh, we got from Bali and Nairobi, uh, including, uh, for example, uh, from the innovative and flexible um, approaches that gave us the trade facilitation agreement. And we must seek to be more open, inclusive, and transparent. Now, looking to MC11 and beyond, I want to see us moving further, uh, faster across the board, and particularly uh, in support of the smaller players. 
Uh, on a connected point, uh, I envisage that technical assistance and capacity building will become increasingly important. Uh, I want to put more focus uh, on this work um, to empower members so that they feel ownership of the system. And this applies to the smallest and the least developed uh, members the most. So we must keep uh, strengthening all pillars of our work. Uh, for example, uh, the dispute settlement system is performing well despite a huge uh, caseload and we acted to deal with the queue of cases uh, that had built up. So we, we, we fixed that, but that doesn't mean that the situation is sustainable. We must ensure that the system will continue to respond uh, in case we see a further rise in cases. So we have a lot of work ahead of us, but let me also say a few words about the broader context. So clearly, and this is the point I made to members, uh, these are challenging times for the multilateral trading system. Uh, global economic growth uh, is low. Uh, trade growth is low. The threat of protectionism cannot be ignored. Uh, multilateralism uh, faces momentous hardships, um, and we struggle uh, with the persistent challenges of poverty, uh, inequality, and underdevelopment. Now, many feel excluded from the benefits of trade, and it is being connected, and wrongly, I must note, uh, with uh, structural unemployment. Uh, we must respond to this. I think we must work harder to ensure that the benefits of trade reach more people, uh, especially in the most vulnerable countries. We need to work with governments uh, to help them build policies that respond to the many challenges of today's economy policies which leverage trade uh, as part of the solution. In my view, uh, trade is a necessary ingredient for any strategy aiming at sustainable social and economic development, and we need uh, to encourage cooperative efforts at the international level. And it seems to me in these uh, challenging times that the value of mutually agreed global rules uh, is evident. Um, as is the ability uh, to resolve economic problems between nations according to those rules. Now, these structures were built in direct response to the bloody lessons of history, and they represent the world's best effort to ensure that the mistakes of the past are not repeated, um, and they provide the tools to deal with many of the problems that are at the forefront of the debate today. Therefore, in my view, this organization is more important than ever. Um, we must take uh, the multilateral trading system, we must not take the multilateral trading system for granted. And I urge the members today uh, to work together uh, to strengthen the system further and ensure that it is more inclusive so that the benefits of trade can be spread as far and as wide as possible. So that will remain my clear goal in the years ahead. And um, with this, uh, I just gave you uh, uh, a summary of the things that I mentioned to members uh, during this process yesterday and today. So thank you all very much for listening, and um, I'm in key hand now. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we have interpretation. If you'd like to pose a question in French or Spanish, that's perfectly fine. Gabriela, did you have a question? Sí, muchas gracias. Gabriela Sotomayor, periodista mexicana del periódico Reforma. ¿Ya, ya me tiene? Eh, ok. Eh, bueno, en realidad eh, tenía dos preguntas, pero creo que todos, bueno, mis compañeros también te, la tendrán la misma, sobre el artículo que salió ayer en, en Financial Times, en donde dicen que la administración de Estados Unidos está buscando alternativas para evadir el sistema de disputas de la OMC, si tiene algunos comentarios al respecto. Y la segunda, quisiera sus reflexiones sobre la tendencia del nuevo gobierno de Estados Unidos de deshacer tratados de comercio regionales tan importantes como el NAFTA. Eh, el señor Trump ha dicho que prefiere hacer acuerdos bilaterales caso por caso, pero no regionales. Entonces, México se va a ver seriamente afectado, como usted lo sabe, pero eh, creo que también Estados Unidos. ¿Usted, ¿Usted qué piensa de esto? ¿Qué consejo le da usted a, a, a México para enfrentar lo que viene con respecto a la renegociación del NAFTA? Eh, y bueno, en realidad quisiera sus comentarios pre precisos sobre esto, sobre NAFTA. Gracias.
Well, uh, on the first question, and I hope that that will also be, uh, uh, that will be applicable, I suppose, to other questions on this, um, about uh, the U.S. Uh, trade policies. Um, let me say that uh, also in that very same article that you mentioned, uh, there is a quote from the White House uh, Deputy Press Secretary, which says, and I'm quoting here, uh, so I'm quoting the article that is quoting the, <laughs> the press secretary. So uh, the quote is, we aren't going to comment uh, on trade policy uh, until we have a USDR in place. Uh, it would be premature to say that the administration is committed to any specific policy until that point. And I share entirely this position. So I would not be in a position to be commenting on any kind of um, uh, specific policy on the part of an administration where uh, the, the nominee for USTR has not even been confirmed. So, and that's m normally my main interlocutor. So once uh, confirmed, I, I, I hope that we will have a, a, a fruitful dialogue uh, with the new administration and with the new team, the new trade team. Um, but until then, I, I will refrain from commenting on uh, any kind of policy that may or may not uh, be put in place. Um, as far as bilaterals are concerned, and uh, the fact that um, uh, maybe the United States uh, is unhappy with uh, trade deals or agreements that were put in place in the past, I, I think the parties of, the, of those agreements and those uh, undertakings are better placed to answer your questions than, than I am. What I would say is that normally in these situations, uh, the best uh, way forward is dialogue, is to sit down, uh, understand where uh, the parties are coming from, uh, what their concerns are, what their difficulties are, and see whether there are uh, ways of uh, overcoming uh, those concerns in a, in a way that is acceptable to all parties of the agreement. Um, I think bilaterals are not new. We bilaterals have been there for a long time. The strategy to pursue uh, trade liberalization uh, by members is, of course, their sovereign decision. There are some members who prefer to do it on, region, on a regional basis. Other members of the WTO do it on a bilateral basis. Um, some do both. Um, some do neither. Um, so it's up to members to decide how they want to pursue uh, what is important is that uh, we keep moving towards um, uh, using trade uh, as a leverage for growth uh, and, and, and development across, across the globe, um, and I think that's the way forward. Bryce and then Assis. Um, thank you for your comments and congratulations on your new term. Um, you mentioned in your speech uh, the challenges facing the WTO in, in the years ahead. Um, without commenting on specific U.S. policies, uh, to what extent do you, ca uh, do you count the Trump administration's America First agenda among these challenges facing the WTO? Thank you. I just actually made the point that it's difficult for me to comment on specific policies when they are not in place. Um, so I would rather uh, not speculate on what has been said in general uh, in, in conceptual terms uh, by uh, people who, who, who are not the USDR, uh, who will be the person that I should be uh, interacting with more closely. So at that point in time, when we do have a USDR, when we begin to have a conversation and a dialogue about uh, trade policies, at that point in time, I think I would be in a better position to to say more right now, uh, there is nothing that I can that I can say. I mean, to follow up, I mean, surely this is something you're monitoring. Is this is this a concern? Is this something that you're planning ahead for? Um, you've got a four-year term, and, and you want to make sure it's successful. Um, what are you? Th what is your thinking uh, as you prepare to uh, meet with the USTR? Well, <laughs> you may not believe it when I say, but I will keep saying this. Uh, whenever a WTO member says they have a problem, then I have a problem. We all have a problem. Um, but that's normal. Uh, what I think we need to do 
is see whether uh, in this process of dialogue that I hope will, will exist um, soon, uh, in that process you, you look at ways at how the system can respond to those concerns. The system is very rich in terms of um, tools that are available to members to address problems that they, they have in their trade relations with other WTO members. I'm sure that a lot of the concerns that exist today can be addressed uh, with many of the tools that are available in the WTO. So I hope that, uh, that um, this conversation will explore those possibilities, uh, but until we actually know uh, and have a deeper conversation about the concerns, uh, because frankly, just, just reading headlines doesn't tell me exactly what the concerns are. Uh, we really need to go deeper uh, in this conversation if we want to have a, a, a fruitful conversation. Assis followed by Tom. Uh, Assis Moreira, Valor Economic São Paulo. Uh, Mr. Azevedo, you said that these are uh, challenging times for the multilateral trade system. Global economic growth is low, trade growth is low. Uh, the threat of uh, protectionism cannot be ignored. So we have also the more than protectionism, the risk of unilateral uh, sanctions. In this scenario, would you say that the risk of trade war is bigger than ever before? I try to not speculate about trade wars because they are serious. And I think that uh, I said before um, that we should not be talking ourselves into a trade war. Um, we saw uh, examples in the past where um, unilateral actions um, uh, on all sides uh, ended up by um, wiping out two-thirds of global trade in just three years. And we saw what happened after that uh, in terms of uh, economic uh, depression and also in terms of uh, conflict um, among nations. So I hope we can avoid uh, anything that even remotely resembles that. Um, I have been uh, saying that quite consistently. I don't think that there is much more than I need to say, really, at this point in time. Tom, and then Ravi. Tom Miles from Reuters. Uh, congratulations on your confirmation in, in your new term. Um, I wanted to ask about dispute settlement. Um, this is on, honestly not intended as, a, as a, another Trump question, but I mean, I know this is in the papers yesterday. But, but seriously, I mean, in the WTO, there's a, there's a tendency to talk about uh, this being a great uh, thing, the dispute settlement um, mechanism, and, and it works extremely well. But seen from outside the WTO, it looks extremely slow. And, you know, we all know that there, okay, maybe some of the backlog has been um, dealt with, but still, um, you know, you've got cases which go through the system at a snail's pace and, and may drag on for years and years and years. So with sort of, you know, increasing talk of uh, trade war, uh, I'm just wondering whether it's possible that, you know, you're, you or the organization is a little complacent um, that this system can um, cope and can satisfy people who want immediate answers uh, because they're not going to get immediate answers and that may, you know, prompt them to, to circumvent the system. Thanks. I think one of the, if it does exist, uh, the perception that the system is extremely slow, that those are your words, uh, not, not, not mine, uh, <clears throat> I think it's mostly because uh, the headlines usually confine themselves to those issues which are very difficult to be handled. Um, and therefore, the members themselves, it's not the system, the system responds timely but the implementation and the solutions, which at the end of the day, we have to end up with a mutually agreed solution. And there is nothing that the system can do to impose that mutually agreed solution on members. It recommends, it makes determinations, it says which actions are in violation of WTO rules and which ones are not. Uh, but that, it stops there. At that point in time, then members have to talk to each other and find solutions. Uh, amongst themselves. If they don't want to find a solution, there is nothing that the system can do to force a solution on them. But that's the minority of the situations. 90% of all WTO disputes have been implemented 
at least that the number of people give me, and I think it's in the ballpark. Mm -hmm. um, 10% are still ongoing, so in the sense that uh, a mutually agreed solution has not been found yet. Compared to other international uh, courts and other international uh, tribunals, uh, the WTO is by far the fastest dispute settlement system that there is out there. Not only that, it is efficient, it is consistent, it is predictable. Um, so it is a pretty good system. I have no doubts about that. Is it a perfect system? No. No system is perfect. The perfect system will be one where you bring a case and uh, a few weeks from now you have a result. Um, that's just not feasible, that's not uh, doable, that's not uh, um, achievable. But uh, within the realm of what can be done in practice, in, in international um, courts, I think we're doing a, a very good job. The next question, emphasis on question, is for you, Ravi, and then we'll go over here. <clears throat> Thank you for the introduction, Keith, and congratulations. But I just come back to uh, the four years, that is 2013 to 2017. In 2013, if I remember, and if everybody remembers in this town, one country and several developing countries reported you, uh, supported you to the maximum. That country is India and several developing countries. On Thursday, 23rd of this month, the Indians have leveled several charges against the manner in which things are happening in your organization under your leadership. They, of course, uh, spoke about selective visibility, the way meetings are conducted, the way negotiating atmosphere is vitiated, and the way the secretariat tends to be proponent for issues of the developed countries while putting the Doha issues in the background. Have you learned any lessons, or what lessons are you going to take in the next four years? Well, the first point I would make is that I was in New Delhi just a few weeks back, and I heard none of that whatsoever. Um, I heard uh, comments about uh, the fact that the Secretariat may have been uh, given more visibility to some issues than others, and there was, um, they took uh, exception to that. Um, what I have to say about that is that not all members want the same thing in the WTO. There are a very large number of developed and developing countries who want to see those issues being discussed, who want to have a conversation about many issues that others don't. Now, it is my job as Director General to ensure that a fair chance for any member and for all members to discuss whatever they want to discuss. I am not going to be precluding conversations. I am not selective on conversations. I try to help all those who ask for help. Thank you. Uh, namely, you know, the, when you were in New Delhi, when you have specifically pointed out when about issues like PSH, SSM, that these are all proponent-driven issues and the proponents have to talk. While on e-commerce or MSMEs, where a very small number of countries are pushing, primarily the developed countries, you act as a uh, proponent here. You put up positions at the G20 meetings. There seems to be uh, incoherence or uh, inconsistency in what you said in New Delhi and what you actually do here in Geneva. Actually, that was a quote from an Indian paper, newspaper, that misrepresented what I said. I did not say that, uh, that the proposals were member-driven with regard to public stock holding or any of those issues. I said that all WTO issues are member-driven, and any proponent that wants to push his issue has to find traction and engagement on the part of other members. All issues. I was not referring to one or two issues in specific. All the issues on the table will have to be the responsibility of the proponents. They will have to get traction. They will have to get engagement on the part of the other members. They will have to convince the other members that they have to talk about this. And this applies to everything. And by the way, I have said this consistently in every single meeting that I participated. Now, if they misconstrue what I said over there, I don't have responsibility for that. Yes, please. 
Hi, Ben Simon from AFP. I apologize again for returning to the United States, but on the subject of newspapers misrepresenting what you say, <laughs> did you tell the Build newspaper that um, without trade, America will never be great again? Is that an accurate quote? No, I don't recall saying that uh, textually, but I think uh, American uh, development and, and, and greatness uh, passes through trade. I have no doubts about that in my mind whatsoever. Thank you, Laurent Ciro, Swiss News Agency. Now that we know that you're going to lead the organization at MC11, uh, which issue do you see at the most promising in order to get an outcome there? And, and what would you consider as the minimal level of outcomes to, con to consider the MC11 as a, as a good one? Well, as I have said before, uh, the promising issues are the issues that make progress, right? Um, at this point in time, what I told members uh, in uh, uh, heads of delegation informal meeting that I had last week was that I thought that all the issues were behind. They were lagging behind. Um, and I didn't see a whole lot of progress in any of the issues. Um, and that proponents needed to do better uh, if they wanted to actually have deliverables by MC11, uh, they would have to to put proposals on the table, they would have to do better in terms of clarifying the issues and, um, and, and, and moving from a conceptual conversation to a more specific conversation where that is needed. Where you already have the specificity, you need to get traction, you need to get others to be on board and to, and to be uh, uh, working together with you. So at this point in time, it's difficult to say which issue is more promising than the other. I think all of them um, have you know, uh, potential, uh, but it will depend a lot on the dynamic of the conversations uh, among members. And the best people to judge that are the chairs that are uh, conducting those uh, conversations. Peter. Yeah, uh, congratulations on, on your re-election, uh, Mr. Azevedo. It, in terms of the general counsel, that part of, of the session seemed to have gone pretty well. But uh, there seemed to have been some blockage in terms of the um, committee chairmen or chairpersons. Could you comment on that? And is that going to affect your work in, uh, for, uh, for the next ministerial? I will um, comment. Uh, but you have to bear in mind that this is a process that is conducted by the chairman of the general council. Uh, this process is not conducted by me. So my, the informations I have are things that he told me. Um, and what I understand uh, from that process, well, first of all, it's not the first time that we have difficulties in selecting the chairs. There are a number of things that go together with that, which is uh, geographical representation, uh, groups, um, nominations, uh, it's about uh, rotation as well. So it's a number of things that need to be taken uh, into consideration. It's normally and usually difficult to get the names, the, the slate done. Um, I think we are close. Uh, I, I hope we are close. And I have urged members, I did so yesterday, um, to show flexibility so that we can get it done as quickly as possible. And the reason why I did that is because, uh, particularly in areas where we have important uh, conversations and negotiations ongoing, for example, the case of agriculture, um, if we don't have a chair, that could have an impact on the development of the work. Um, and that could affect uh, the ability to get outcomes um, in time for the ministerial conference in Buenos Aires. Come back for two right here. Uh, thank you. Um, you. You mentioned in your speech you had uh, three benchmarks for your first term, strengthen all pillars of the organization, breathe life into the negotiating work, and hit the ground running. Um, for this next term, what are the benchmarks that you will set uh, you know, by which you will have either success or failure? Thank you. Well, those, those benchmarks are still there. I, think, I don't think that they, they disappear. Uh, we keep improving 
uh, on them. Um, but I think uh, that there is more that can be done, particularly in terms of inclusiveness. And this is something that I have been uh, stressing over and over again. We must do our best to make sure that trade benefits more people, um, especially in developing countries and in the least developed countries. One important element of that is facilitating um, the situation for small and medium enterprises or micro, small and medium enterprises. Um, they, in many countries, are responsible for sometimes 90% of the workforce. Um, and if they participate more, uh, the benefits of trade uh, will, uh, will be felt uh, more widely. And that may even help uh, to change a little bit the perception that trade only works for the big companies, which is, which is not true. But uh, definitely we can do better uh, for the small and medium enterprises. And, and this is something that I think we should um, have in the back of our minds. Of course, uh, one other thing that we need to do is maintain uh, uh, development at the back of our minds on all the issues that we are working. Um, we need to ensure that uh, uh, the playing field is more level uh, for the developing countries and for the least developed in particular. Um, in that situation, for example, uh, technical assistance and, and capacity building are very important elements. We need to help uh, smaller delegations to, uh, to engage more uh, and on better terms here in the organization, in the WTO. Um, there is, there is still a whole lot to do also in terms of negotiations. Uh, we, we need to continue to deliver, uh, and that's not easy. That's not easy. Uh, and we need to deliver, like I said, wherever and whenever we can. Um, and these, are, these, I think, are, are pretty important uh, steps, particularly in light of this um, anti-trade sentiment that you see out there. We need to make uh, trade uh, the trade benefits more visible uh, than, than ever before. The dernier question, s'il vous plaît. Thanks. Actually, it's a kind of follow-up on my previous one because I think you answered the first part of the question, but that the second, and it's in line with what you just said. Um, would you consider, for instance, uh, an agreement on fishery subsidies as, as enough in order to value the MC11 as a good one? or? or I mean, what would be the extent of, of uh, agreement needed to, to uh, consider that as a success? Well, I, I, never, I never try to set up uh, from the beginning minimum requirements for a successful ministerial. Uh, in general, you see success, you, you know success when you see it. Uh, so let's see what happens in MC11. Um, I, I, I don't want to be setting minimum minimal standards for, for a successful ministerial conference. We have a very hard year ahead of us, uh, many, many, many challenges. Um, if we get uh, to MC11 in good shape and if we have the membership rallying around uh, important issues and trying to get things done, if that mood is there, that's, that's uh, already a, a big achievement. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. We Okay, it's a very short question. Uh, okay, okay, China Radio International. So my question is, compared to United States uh, position, China side it will stick to the globalization process. So what do you think China contribute, uh, can contribute to the multilateral trade system in the world? Thank you. I think those, uh, those declarations are very welcome. Uh, that they show a disposition to work with the system. Uh, and I hope that um, all WTO members uh, follow uh, the same principle of uh, trying to, to discuss and have dialogues and, and solve their, their differences and, and discuss their concerns uh, in the system. Um, I, I welcome that and, uh, and I hope that, uh, that China will follow through. Uh, by uh, being a, a champion of the multilateral trading system and working uh, with the system to find solutions that um, are um, positive uh, for all uh, WTO members. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much and good afternoon.